Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 1, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. Also on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the growing battle over whether to overdraw the permanent fund. Second, we explain what representatives Merrick and Rasmussen really mean when they say they intend to stop a, quotes, income tax, close quotes. And third, we celebrate some good news from the oil patch. And then at the end, in a bonus round, Michael and I respond to a listener's question about whether we believe Bill Walker is likely to run for governor in 2022. And now, let's join Michael. It is Tuesday. Speaking of redundantly redundant, we don't always go over the same thing, but it seems like we continue to circle back. Uh, it seems like we continue to circle back to some of the same issues each and every time. The weekly top three is our chance to dive down deep into some issues that are important. Uh, and bringing me that information every week is my friend Brad Keithley, who is the founder and director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. He's a full, former oil and gas attorney, now retired, who has dedicated his life to trying to bring Alaska back on track. He comes on every Tuesday and starts with us uh, this morning. Good morning, my friend. How are you? I'm doing fine, Michael. Are you suggesting this is Groundhog Day every Tuesday? I mean, every Tuesday. It's You know, it's not always the same thing exactly, but it seems like we revisit some highlights each and every morning, right? I mean, it's just it seems like we keep coming back to some of the same basic tonal issues well in part that's because we never get anything resolved we just keep that's true kicking, kicking keep kicking the can down the road and so it twists it twists a little bit it twists like five degrees but it's the same you're right it's the same issue uh, uh time after time if we could get some of these resolved we could move on to other things yeah no absolutely i mean i think what are we doing this for brad six years now six years we've been going seven years now and uh, seven it's, years yeah, now. it seems like we keep coming back to some of the same issues over and over again and we're like i mean can't we just we've laid the answers out we've laid we've we've discussed it we've dissected it we've given you probably multiple options for how to fix it and yet nobody wants to do it and i just i wonder what the I wonder what the heck is going on with that. All right, well let's uh, let's dive in here in the beginning and start uh, kicking things off. Um, the coming battle over the permanent fund draw and uh, the overdraw that's going to be happening. What what are we what are we talking about here, Brad? Well, Michael, this is uh, talking about Groundhog Day. This is a continuation of basically a continuation of what we've been doing for the last ten years. Which is which is going to some reserve pot of money um, at the end of the legislature, saying, "Well, we we've got this deficit. Uh, we're not ready to make the hard decisions yet, and, and so we're going to go to this reserve pot of money uh, and 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 tide us over one more year. And we promise, by gosh, we promise, when we come back next year, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do all this. And that's that's been going on for ten years. During the past ten years." We drained down twenty billion dollars of 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 those sorts of reserves between the CBR, uh, the SBR, the statutory budget reserve. We drained that, and then the constitutional budget reserve. We've now come close to draining that. Uh, we've just kept kicking the can down the road. Now we're coming to this legislature. Uh, uh, the legislators during the campaign all said, "Oh, we got to resolve this. We got to resolve this." But now that we're in session, we, we find, you know, one more effort by some 
to kick the can down the road or one by 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 some factions to kick the can down the road by saying, well, what we'll do now is we'll just start, you know, easing in and doing overdraws from the from the permanent fund earning, earnings reserve. And by overdraws, what we what what they mean is taking more than the five uh, percent draw set by SB 26, the 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 percent of market value draw set by SB 26 in consultation uh, with the permanent fund corporation uh, on how they do things. Uh, taking more than that five percent to to, uh, to fund government. Um, at the be- at the beginning of the year, it looked like there was just no way around uh, uh, having to do that uh, in some form or fashion. Right. But as the year's gone on, uh, it's beginning to look like um, uh, that is not a necessity uh, 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 be- for a couple of reasons. One, the principal one is because oil prices have gone up. And, and we're looking now in FY22 uh, at about $400 million more in oil revenues than, we're, than are what in the latest forecast. Now, that depends upon oil prices staying uh, uh, up uh, uh, to the levels that they've, that they've sort of achieved, at the levels that the, that the futures market are telling us uh, 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 that they're projecting out now. Uh, but, it, it, yeah, I mean, given what OPEC's doing and given what uh, – uh, given what's going on on the demand side in the market, that that four hundred million dollars is looking pretty good. So, w- what we're coming down to is 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 this choice between going to the going to the to the reserves, uh, what we what we're calling the reserves yet again, uh, to to fund government or, um, frankly, living with our means. The the issue that this is all coming down to is is the permanent fund dividend. To 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 have any sort of a reasonable permanent fund dividend, uh, given that we don't have other revenue sources right now, to have any sort of reasonable permanent fund dividend, you would have to make a a an overdraw. You would have to go into the earnings reserve uh, to uh, to get additional amounts to uh, to make that dividend. And so we're having this battle is coming is coming sort of uh, into light or coming into focus. Uh, around the permanent fund dividend, Governor Dunleavy has said that he wants to make a, uh, an overdraw in order to have a full PFD in uh, FY22. Right, um, and he's recently got some backing for that. Uh, Andrew Jensen, who's the uh, editor of the, the managing editor of the Alaska Journal of Commerce, wrote a uh, an op-ed uh, earlier uh, la- or last week uh, in support of that, saying that. Uh, uh, saying that he would support uh, uh, going big for a permanent fund uh, overdraw, but the governor's the governor's rationale around that is that Alaskans need money, and frankly, part of the pushback that I think we're going to see uh, in the near future is uh, Alaskans are going to get money. Uh, the 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 federal relief package that's currently before Congress adds another fourteen hundred dollars. Uh, on top of the $600 that was passed uh, to, to individuals that was passed uh, in December, uh, that that $1,400 uh, for a family of four earning less than $1,550,000 would produce uh, $5,600 in direct payments uh, to that family compared to the $3,400 that came from the CARES Act uh, last year. So it's it, it, we, we have money coming into the economy. And I think as this debate goes on, uh, we're going to hear a lot more about, well, we're already getting this injection of money coming in from the federal government, the $5,600 in, in terms of direct payments from the federal government, plus uh, another $400 in uh, uh, unemployment compensation, uh, extra unemployment compensation uh, provided by the federal government, plus uh, there is additional uh, uh, compensation in the additional payments in the federal package for uh, poor families uh, uh, with children. So there's a lot of money coming out of the federal government that's going to come into the economy. The question is whether we need to, the question, the debate's going to be whether we make the permanent fund overdraw, which is essentially a tax on future generations, uh, or whether we uh, we balance the budget without doing that overdraw, live, live within our means, as some will put it, 
uh, and rely on the federal government payments uh, to provide the additional money that some say uh, Alaska families need. Well, and how much, I mean, Brad, we've warned about this, right? I mean, we talked a little bit about this before where, uh, you know, the, the, the downside was if oil prices go up, I mean, that's better for the state, but it also gives them more political cover and more room to kick the can down the road yet again and not face the harsh issue of the $13,000 per Alaskan in spend in state government. I mean, it just it gives them one more excuse not to have to face those hard choices uh, yet again. And this is a choice. It's eventually going to have to be made because it's going to continue to increase. It's going to go up. I mean, govern, the, the budget increases $100 plus million a year every year. If we do nothing and absolutely everything remained the same and the, and the legislature was out of session and everything else, it would go up. Eventually, we're going to have to face this issue. This is It's kind of like a, t- a two-edged sword. I mean, one, great, we've got more revenues coming into the state, but two, it doesn't, fa- it doesn't force them to face the consequences of their action. Well, we are facing the consequences in the sense that balancing the budget would mean virtually no PFD. Um, uh, living within our means would mean virtually no PFD. We would be using, we would be taxing the PFD uh, in order to... Uh, virtually entirely in order to uh, to balance the budget. So the choice that we're really coming to, we cho- the choice we've been headed toward uh, for the entire past decade, and the choice we're really coming to is, is are we going to run government uh, by taxing the PFD, pushing the burden uh, to middle and lower income Alaska families, or are we going to run government on a more equitable well, uh, uh, revenue basis? But that may be the that may be the easiest path, and we all know that the path of least resistance is usually the path taken. I mean, that may be the easiest path, but the bottom line is is that that money is Alaskans' money. It's owed to them. It should be paid, and the monies, the efficiency, should be found in other areas. There are plenty of other areas that we've delineated on the show, whether it's you know formulaic cuts, uh, you know. Uh, uh, efficiencies, unfilled positions, I mean, all these other things that could be addressed. The easiest thing is just to take the PFD from people. It doesn't Absolutely. make it the right thing to do. Absolutely. There are there are cuts that can be made in government. Absolutely. I mean, we've talked about them for the last 10 years. Uh, you've got uh, uh, the university is a, is, is a good example. You've got uh, Medicaid. 50% of Medicaid is uh, is is optional Medicaid. This, Alaska's opted into more, virtually uh, almost more Medicaid services, optional Medicaid services, uh, than uh, than any other state. We haven't examined uh, the BSA since 2008, since Mike Hawker did it in 2008. We haven't reexamined uh, K through 12 funding. Absolutely, there are there are places to make uh, to make uh, cuts uh, in government to make it uh, to to create a lower cost government, but. The governor tried to do that in 2019. Uh, we saw the the explosion, the pushback uh, that occurred. He couldn't even get 16 uh, legislators to support the level of cuts uh, that he proposed to make at the time. He had to settle for a much lower um, uh, level of cuts as a, as a result of that, and those essentially got wiped out uh, in uh, in the subsequent legislature. Uh, the, gov- the, the it's, it, it, it started the ball rolling on the recall effort, which continues to this day. Uh, and the governor has not the governor uh, has not uh, proposed those deep cuts uh, in either of the subsequent two budgets that that he's proposed. To make those cuts, you've got to have 21. Ultimately, you got to have 21 plus 11. The governor could do it uh, uh, for a year. Uh, for or for a sequence of years by making the vetoes and having 16 uh, back him up in the legislature, but uh, he he seems unwilling to do that, and that's only a temporary fix because you know when you roll into the next governor, whether by recall or 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 by election, uh, uh, then you start all over again. To make those cuts permanent, you've got to have 21 plus 11 to redo uh, the formulas, to redo the 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 appropriations. Uh, uh, process and 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 we just haven't had it. So, you know, the, yes, we can. You know, theoretically, we can uh, we can we can make those cuts. Yes, the, theoretically, the governor can come in and do it, but he hasn't. He, he hasn't. He didn't have the backing in in 2019 when he tried to do it, and he hasn't. Uh, he hasn't uh, uh, even proposed to do it uh, in the in the two years subsequent to that. Uh, Brad maintains his static argument that leadership won't make cuts. There's no basis for this legislature. I don't know exactly what that last sentence means, but 
I mean, I think, Brad, you're just you're just painting the obvious. I mean, there is no I mean, I think it's basically a way of saying there is no political will to make cuts. We would all love to see the cuts made. I mean, it's what I was trying to say when you were saying, well, they're just going to go out to the PFD because it's the path of least resistance. Uh, if we keep pushing back on, well, there's got to be more than that. There's got to be other cuts. There's got to be things to, to, to do. You're right. The PFD is the easiest path. It is the easiest road. But there is, has been, up until this point, no political will to make any other substantive cuts. That's the bottom line. And Michael, there's not there's as long as we use the PFD as a funding mechanism, there's not going to be, because as as I've said over and over and over on the show, but I'll say it one more time, the top twenty percent have no incentive uh, uh, to make cuts. They're not paying for for government. They've shut the using the PFD shoves the burden of the cost to middle and lower income Alaska families, uh, and the top twenty percent is not paying. So there's this, as I've said before, there's this unholy alliance between those who want to maintain government spending and the top 20 percent like Natasha uh, in the legislature who are saying, OK, we won't we won't move to get, cut government spending as long as you won't try to pay for government spending by taxing us, as long as you continue to use PFD cuts. And if you don't have the top 20 percent engaged in trying to make in trying to make uh, uh, spending cuts, which you don't, as long as you can use PFDs, uh, if you don't have the top 20% engaged, then you don't have the donor class engaged. You don't have the lobbyist class engaged. You don't have the people who actually uh, 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 can motivate the legislature, motivate legislators to make cuts. You don't have them engaged in the process of trying to make cuts. So I, we're, we're failing. Not only is not only is the uh, is there this huge push to keep government spending at at, at fairly at, at current levels, and if not higher, but we're not u- we're using a funding mechanism which which enables that by cents, not right. by not pushing the burden <clears throat> the portion of the burden off on the on the very class uh, uh, donor class that could that could force those spending cuts to come about. Yeah. Give me a tease for number two, which is of course uh, Reps Merrick and Rasmussen. They both said in both in public forums and in their letters to the to their constituents that one of the reasons why they broke with the Republican caucus was to prevent an income tax. Uh, you're going to tell us what is it, you're going to translate that for us. I am, and and uh, and and when they say they they oppose an income tax, uh, they oppose one form of income tax. But but I think I think what they're not saying is that they're implicitly favoring. Uh, another form of income tax, a, con- a continuation of the of the type of income tax that we've uh, that we've had. So uh, we're going to talk we're going to talk about exactly what they mean when they say income tax and why that's why that's really a linguistic sleight of hand uh, to uh, to to jump past uh, 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 jump jump past some controversy that they're trying to avoid. Wait, you mean uh, words matter? Is that what you're trying to say? Are you trying to, try to say <laughs> words. Words do matter. Words words matter, and what you say really means something. We're into number two, which is this discussion that we're hearing out of people like Kelly Merrick and Sarah Rasmussen, that one of the reasons why they jumped ship from the Republican caucus was because they wanted to protect us all from an income tax. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily sound... Uh, it doesn't mean what you think it means. You keep saying that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Uh, Brad, what do, you, what, do you, what do you read into this? So, so what's going on here is this. We have an income tax. Alaska has had an income tax since 2016. PFD cuts are the diversion of, of, of private sector income, the statutory, statutory private sector income, the diversion of private sector income to government through withholding and then, and then, and then reappropriation of that money to, uh, uh, to government. It is the classic, it fits the classic economic definition of a tax, and it's a tax on income. Uh, in, dollars that otherwise would go into the pockets of um, of, uh, of of largely middle and lower income uh, Alaska families have the biggest impact on lower and middle and lower income Alaska families. So we have an income tax. So what is it? What is it that Merrick and Rasmussen are really saying when they say, "Well, we're going to oppose an income tax"? I mean, they, they've not. Neither one of them have opposed uh, PFD cuts. They both voted for budgets uh, that have uh, that have continued. Uh, PFD cuts. So what is it exactly they're saying? Well, what they're saying is that they're going to oppose an alternative revenue source that would, in fact, uh, uh, tax uh, the top 20 percent. 
um, it would in fact reach and have an impact uh, on the top 20% uh, uh, through uh, uh, through uh, setting the tax rate based upon based upon overall income as a portion as opposed to the portion of the income that comes through uh, that comes through the PFD. What what Merrick and, and Rasmussen really are saying is we've gotten ourselves on the finance committee to it's like Natasha to protect the top 20% to protect uh, a segment of the Alaska. Uh, 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 income brackets to protect the top uh, 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 Alaska income bracket from paying a uh, their share a share uh, of of the cost of government. N- neither of them said anything about protecting against PFD cuts, which is the true income tax we've had uh, since 2016. So I take it I, I take it that, that what we've got here is really just you know sort of the House version of Natasha. Uh, uh, over uh, over on the Senate, Natasha has continued to push back, saying we're not going to have an income tax. I'm going to I'm going to stop an income tax. Uh, uh, by income tax, she means a, a revenue source that would include the top 20 percent. I'm going to stop that over in the Senate. Basically, now we have Merrick and Rasmussen over in the House uh, uh, doing the same thing, and and it's significant. I mean, I, I think about this for a moment. The, the 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 Democrats, the minority uh, uh, Democrats in the House, the, the the coalition that's got put primarily by Democrats, should be the ones that look out for the average Alaskan. They should be the ones that look out for middle and lower income Alaska taxpayers. Yet they've agreed uh, to put uh, uh, Kelly Merritt and, and and Sarah Rasmussen, who are making these statements uh, on the House Finance Committee. Which effectively uh, would, will serve as a block uh, to uh, to a, a, a more broad-based uh, uh, revenue coming in, uh, getting getting its way through the, the House Finance Committee. So, I mean, it's Rasmussen and uh, Rasmussen and Merrick really don't oppose an income tax. Um, uh, what they really oppose is is a is a revenue approach that would include. Uh, the top 20 percent, and they're terming that, they're calling that an income tax, uh, in order to be able to uh, uh, sell themselves as uh, as as conservatives or as 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 non-taxers to their constituencies. But at the same time, they're doing that. They're they're they've supported uh, 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 the, the 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 income tax we've had since 2016 uh, in the legislature. I it's it's a misuse of language, frankly. Uh, in order to cover uh, by it's a misuse of language by them in order to cover uh, what they're really doing and what they're really doing is is being protectionist of the top 20 percent um, as opposed to uh, protectionist of uh, Alaska families on the whole well let me play devil's advocate because I think what they would say was well it's not really an in- I mean it's not an income tax because that's not you know it's government money it's a payout it's a dividend it's a welfare check I mean that's kind of the reaction that many on the uh, on the right seem to have when it comes down to taking the PFD that seems to be their argument is that well it's really a government expenditure and so it's not really income uh, it's just a nice to have it's not a must have and so they don't they don't see it that way well and 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 that ignores that just ignores governor Hammond but it ignores the, to me the fundamental issue is this uh, uh, the the PFD is Alaska's form of oil royalty uh, if you live in the lower 48 where you have private ownership of lands, uh, landowners get a share of oil profits directly into their bank accounts uh, through royalties. In Alaska, because the state was set up under the, under the Statehood Act by the federal government that the state owns uh, the, the lands, uh, the, the royal, royalty estate, the mineral estate, instead of, instead of allowing private ownership – those uh, funds initially, those funds that otherwise in the lower 48 would go to individual, would go to individuals into their bank accounts, goes initially into in Alaska goes initially into the state's bank account. Governor Hammond brilliantly saw through uh, that issue and said, "Look, uh, in Alaska, the Alaskans are the landowners. Uh, Alaskans are the landowners, and we're going to share a portion of." Those uh, those oil benefits, oil revenues, to Alaskans through the PFD. The PFD is really no more than the Alaska royalty. Um, uh, it is a share of the 
of the benefits from the income. What 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 Rasmussen and and Merrick, if they make that argument, what they're really saying is Alaska is really a socialist state, and and we're going to confiscate all the benefits of of the mineral estate to the state, as opposed to allowing it to flow to individuals as it does uh, elsewhere. Uh, in in the lower 48, and and we're gonna and the state's gonna hang on to those that money uh, instead of instead of as Governor Hammond envisioned, uh, allowing a portion of it to flow through uh, as royalties to uh, to the individual Alaskan uh, uh, owners. I mean, it's it, it's really a very socialist argument on their part if that if that's the argument if that's the argument that they make. Well, and as I've pointed out, I mean, the state already receives 75 percent of the royalties, goes right into the coffers, all the corporate taxes, all the infrastructure taxes, all the ancillary fees and taxes go straight to the to the state's bottom line. And then they get 50 percent of the revenue of the tw- the 25 percent royalties that go into the permanent fund itself and then is spun off in the earnings. They get another 50 percent of that. I mean, they're already at like 97 plus percent of all the income that's generated by the resources of the state they're already taking them and spending them and now they want the other three percent yeah and it's and and it's a specialized tax michael it's the same as if in texas or oklahoma the state came in and said you know royalty owners you're going to pay all of your royalties instead of you getting to bank those royalties that you get under your lease payments you're going to pay all those royalties to the state uh as a tax it's a specialized income tax uh, that uh, that that takes away Alaskans uh, royalty checks uh, uh, and puts them uh, puts them into the state. It's it's not. I mean, it you you there there is no way from a classical economic standpoint. There's no way to avoid saying uh, that this is an income tax, statutorily created income that goes to income that goes to individuals is being withheld by the state. In, in its capacity as sort of the middleman, the intended middleman of this transaction. Governor Hand, Hammond set it up so that the Permanent Fund Corporation spun off earnings. The earnings went to the state. Uh, the state as a middleman, as sort of the fiduciary, distributed it out to the to the royalty owners. What, what's happening is the state in this middleman role is saying, oh, no, no, we're going to take it. We're going to take it all for ourselves. It's like your stockbroker said, you know, all those profits you made by your investments. Now we're just going to I'm going to take those because I need them for some I need them for something else. So there's 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 no avoiding from a classical economic standpoint. There's no avoiding that this is an income tax. Um, uh, on on Alaska families that hit a specialized income tax that hit middle and lower income <clears throat> Alaska families the hardest. Yeah. It is an income tax, and and for Rasmussen and Merrick to say, oh, we're going to oppose an income tax. I mean, the the what translated what that really means is we're going to oppose an inca- income tax on the t- that that affects the top twenty percent. That's what we're here for. We're going to let this income tax that affects middle and lower income Alaska families continue to roll. We're just going to oppose the income taxes that would that would reach the top 20 percent. Harold says, keep believing 20 percent of Alaskans are the cause of Alaska's fiscal fiscal issue. It's high government spending. Who passes the budget? The 60 folks you send to Juno, that's the issue. I mean, why you think that these two things are mutually exclusive, Harold? That to keep keep believing that 20 percent of Alaskans are the cause of Alaskans' fiscal issue, it's high government spending. Those two things are inexorably joined. I mean, I think that's what Brad is trying to say. I mean, the high government spending is due in part to the fact that the top 20 percent have not had a fiscal shoe in this game. I mean, they they are not feeling the pain like those. And Timothy, I think, made a comment earlier on about how the low income earners or non earners are the, are not going to feel the pain. They're all feeling the pain. Everyone's feeling the pain right now at different levels. When they take the PFD, it affects everyone. Now, those at the lower and middle income cl- classes feel it a lot more. I mean, when you're only making twenty thousand dollars a year and they take three thousand four thousand five thousand dollars a year from your family income that's a significant chunk they feel it more than the millionaire or the person who makes five hundred thousand bucks a year they feel it a lot more than that and i think that's the point that brad is trying to make on this oh absolutely right michael i mean uh, itap did a, did a great study in 2017 about the distribute about the the impact by income bracket uh, of uh, of PFD cuts and at a at a billion dollars if you're trying to raise uh, a billion dollars and you're cutting the PFD to raise that that billion dollars you're taking something like 18 percent 
of the income of the of the lowest 20 percent you're still taking like 10 percent of the income of the next lowest 20 uh, percent uh, that's that's the tax rate income 18 percent of of their income counting the pfd is being is being taxed away because you're diverting you're diverting the pfd you're taking something like 0.2 percent uh of the top uh, top 20 percent uh, income I mean, you're, you're taking a, a latte a day or, you know, a, a, a nice meal. On comparative, your right. Exactly. As a comparative, right. I mean, exactly. Yeah. It's like you're taking a car away from one guy, you're taking a cheeseburger away from the other guy. That's, I mean, as far as buying power. That's yeah, what we're talking exactly about. Right. And Brad has talked about all, I mean, we've talked about all the different things that could be done to help bring, uh, you know, the revenue back in. And we have talked about oil taxation, Harold. We've talked about it. Brad has admitted that there's money left on the table. We could still we could still visit uh, on the oil taxation issue. That there, We could still pull, you know, a couple, several hundred million dollars out of that deal as we sit down and revisit it and lock it in. Brad's not oh, shied away from that. Oh, heck, I took, I took huge amounts of... of of crap from friends in the fall supporting Prop One. I mean, what do you mean I haven't I haven't talked about oil taxes? I was all over Prop One uh, uh, in the fall, uh, and 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 there are ways that you can that you can adjust oil taxes. I mean, but oil taxes are not the solution. We're not going to raise a billion dollars uh, through uh, through it, through increased oil taxes. You have to find there have to be other ways in which Alaskans participate. Uh, all Alaskans participate equitably. Uh, in the cost uh, in the cost of the government and PFD cuts PFD cuts just isn't it and but 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 to go back I mean Rasmussen and and it, it's so blatant if you if you really understand what's going on it's so blatant what Rasmussen and Merrick are doing they are so blatantly signing up for the top 20 percent we're you know saying we're gonna we have an income tax saying now we're gonna oppose the income tax clearly just means we're going to oppose an income tax applying the the the, the, the revenue uh, approaches to uh, to the top twenty percent. Uh, it's just, I mean, there, we, we've got to raise revenue if we're not going to cut costs and we're not going to cut spending. We've got to raise revenue, and we've got to raise we, we've got to raise revenue in an equitable manner. And 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 Merrick and Rasmussen are just saying they're going to oppose that. Well, and like I said, I mean, I think that I mean, I'm still hoping for cuts. I'm still hoping that with the new crop of legislators in there that we have uh, some chance of getting in there and talking about some of the cuts that could be made on all the places that we've talked about today. Uh, you know, the school funding and, and, uh, and formulas and, and allocations, the, the uh, uh, Hess budget, and uh, yes, even a discussion on oil taxes. I think all of those things need to be on the table. Uh, but I mean, we've got to face it. Past performance is indicative of future results. And heretofore, the legislature as a corporate body has not been willing to make those cuts necessary. And with the increase in oil revenues, it seems less likely that it will happen now than it would have three or four months ago. Yeah, exactly right. They're, 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 I mean, they're going to use that, use that as an excuse to say, well, we, we've sort of got through it. We've got to cut the PFD deep. But we don't need to raise revenues any other way. In, in, in essence, saying we've got to tax middle and lower income Alaska families deep, uh, but uh, but that'll be enough. We don't we don't need to put any revenue responsibility anywhere else uh, anywhere else in government. And, and and Michael, not only do you need a legislature to, to to have cuts, you need a governor to back up cuts. And after twenty nine after the experience of twenty nineteen, after not getting sixteen to back him up on the deep cuts, um, uh, and and having to you know limit his cuts to, to a much smaller amount to, to finally get 16 uh, to support him. Um, and, and, and after the recall efforts, the governor's just not behind this anymore. Um, and, and he's not going to be behind it. The recall sitting there, you know, poised to, 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 to get enough votes. The governor's not going to, to, to push the cuts necessary uh, to, uh, the, to, to, to overcome this, overcome the deficit through cuts because it will just trigger the recall on him. So it's just, we are where we are. We tried in 2019. We tried. It failed. It failed miserably. Uh, the recall sprung from it. The governor hasn't tried again yeah. and, and isn't going yeah. to try again. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're down to the last two minutes here. Number three, uh, some good news. Leave us with some good news here, Brad. There's, there's really good news on the PICA project. The PICA project is 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 on state lands it's not affected by uh, the, the president biden's uh, uh uh actions with respect to federal lands it's on state lands huge prospect huge 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 project 
uh, on state lands. Uh, important to Alaska, the first tranche of it is about 80,000 barrels a day. I've been concerned, others have been concerned about whether the project is going to get uh, adequate funding uh, to go forward. That issue hasn't been resolved yet, but, but the owners, Oil Search and Repsol, feel comfortable enough that they're continuing to fund uh, uh, the project. There were some announcements made by Oil Search uh, in its annual report uh, uh, last week. Uh, Kay Cashman of Petroleum News followed up uh, with an interview with uh, with Oil Search. There's an article on that uh, in the Petroleum News that I would recommend uh, uh, people to read. But Oil Search uh, continues on. Now there are there's a, a lot of steps yet to go. They are trying to uh, uh, sell a portion of their interest in order to help with the funding and frankly help their their uh, corporate uh, 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 fiscal situation uh, out. A lot of things to go, but but. But good news in the sense that uh, they're continuing on. They've, they've had additional discoveries. They've dealt additional wells. They're making investments out in the field, and they've indicated they're going to continue to make the investments necessary uh, to flush out the project over the over the course of the year. And in the chat room just said, I heard Walker is thinking of running again. Hope that's not true. Unfortunately, it is true. And with the passage of, uh, of, um, of Prop 2, uh, it might be uh, more realistic than you think uh, with the uh, with the so far the ranked voting and the jungle primary and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Bill Walker may have a larger chance, and and uh, I think Brad and I were talking about this earlier. Scott Kendall, of course, uh, one of uh, Bill Walker's lackeys, was uh, was one of the prime movers and shakers in this uh, Prop Two uh, fiasco as well. So this is a. The, it's a multiplicity of, of bad bad issues coming forward, Brad. He was, and 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 just think about what Prop Two does. Prop Two has an open primary uh, where anybody can file. You don't, and you're not running in your in in your party lane. You're running all together. It's like the California primary system or the Louisiana primary system. And the top four from from that primary go to the uh, general election. Top four. So uh, let's say, uh, 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 you know, Governor Dunleavy runs. Let's say the, the Democrats have a candidate that they want to run. There's still two more slots uh, that go to the general election. Bill Walker is relatively well off, uh, uh, has self-funded most of his campaigns. Uh, he ran for governor in 2010, 2014, uh, uh, 2018, uh, and, uh, and, and can self-fund. Uh, uh, his, his run, I, you know, if he has any inclination to do it, that, that, that top four is, is, is a big attraction because you can get yourself to the, to the, to the general election by just finishing, uh, in the top four in the primary. So I, I think there's more than, than a likelihood. I mean, the fact that, that Walker's surfacing it, uh, I think is certainly, uh, an indication that he's, that he's prepared to do it. Um, he really doesn't have to raise money to do it. I think there's more than a likelihood that uh, that Walker runs. And what you're looking for uh, is is getting in the top four, uh, and then in the general election, you don't have to win. Uh, you don't have to get the majority or the plurality of votes in the general election. Uh, if if you hold the top guy under 50 percent, then you start counting second votes. Uh, uh, in uh, for candidates and 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 third votes, I think I think we go down to three um, uh, third votes for candidates and 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 whoever uh, ends up with more than fifty percent out of ultimately ends up with more than fifty percent as as you eliminate the lowest uh, vote getter, uh, whoever ends up with more than fifty percent wins. So I, you know, that's a very for somebody like Walker who can self fund. I mean, the the big issue in these in in, the, in a jungle primary, and the big issue in the general is whether you can raise the funds to be able to do it. Um, uh, somebody like Walker who can self fund, I think that's a. I, I would say there there is a much higher than seventy five percent chance that Walker does it. Well, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. <clears throat> we'll see. Uh, I appreciate your weekly beating here, and uh, hopefully next week we'll maybe we'll have something new. I appreciate you coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate you coming out and uh, being part of it today. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube 
SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.